Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone, good afternoon. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Pauline shanks Corin, and I am the Stockdale Chair in Professional Military Ethics in the College of Leadership and Ethics. And I'm joined by um, my colleague, uh, Thomas Gibbons, who is also a member of that department and works with our provost here. And this uh, Lou today is part of a series on leadership and ethics that we're having throughout the spring. Um, so some of you may have joined us yesterday for August Cole's talk and there'll be um, conversations in March and April um, as well. Um, so today we're really um, blessed to have Dr. Christian Miller from Wake Forest University in North Carolina uh, with us. This is his second time at the Naval War College last year, he spoke to our Stockdale uh, leaders group about his book, Character Gap, which if you're interested in ethics and want an accessible read, um, highly recommend that book. Um, but to, yes, it's right there. And our, our, we had a faculty reading group on it last year as well. Um, and so it's a great sort of place to start and a, and a great conversation starter. Um, but this morning, um, well, this afternoon, sorry, uh, he's going to talk about some of his newer work, uh, which is on honesty. Um, and of course, honesty is something that's uh, important to all of us who, who teach um, military and civilian leaders here at the Naval War College. Um, and so looking forward to his conversation. So he's going to talk probably for about 45 minutes. And then my colleague, Tom Gibbons, is going to moderate the session. So as the time uh, draws near for discussion, if you would put your questions or comments for uh, Dr. Miller into chat, that that would be helpful. So I'm going to turn it over to Christian. Welcome, and thank you awesome. for joining us. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that introduction. It's great to be back. I've had a great time last year with, uh, with discussing ethics and character, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation today about honesty. Um, I should say right off the bat, I'm, I'm a civilian, and, and I'm not uh, you know, not very knowledgeable about the military world. So I'm going to be talking about honesty from a philosophical and a psychological perspective, but I don't have the toolkit to make the connections to a lot of the challenges you're facing. So I really hope that you'll make those connections during our discussion and we can, we can investigate how what I'm saying might be relevant and helpful for the challenges you're facing when it comes to matters of dishonesty. Um, I also want to say, I have a handout. Um, this is optional. Everything I'm going to be using a PowerPoint slide, so you can just follow along with the PowerPoint if you like. But if you'd like to have a handout um, to take with you afterwards, to write notes on or anything like that, I'm going to now put the link to the handout in the chat. Um, you can go to that website, and you'll see right there on the website a link to the handout. You can download it as a Word document. Again, it's completely optional. Everything on the handout is also going to be in the slides. But if you are like me, you like to have something to look at and to take with you later and ponder and reflect back on, then that's a resource. Um, okay, I'm now going to share screen. Um, does that look okay? Look it looks good. great. All right, good. So let's get started. Uh, I'm going to talk about three main issues, as you can see from the title. What is honesty? Are most people honest? And how can we become more honest? It's going to be a lot of, I've got a lot to say. So I'm going to be trying to be cognizant of the time. And as, as we go along, I may skip some things just to be sure to reserve some time for question and answer. But I really have some, uh, I think, really interesting and important and, uh, and controversial ideas to share with you. Um, now, let's see. Here we go. So I think it's not hard to motivate interest in this topic. Uh, honesty and dishonesty are in the news all the time. I was thinking of choosing some contemporary examples, but then I thought I might ruffle some feathers or make some people annoyed right from the start. So that's probably not a good idea. So I'll go back a little bit. Historically, there's a famous example. There's a famous example. If you don't know who those people are, maybe you need to ask your, your student, like you know, undergraduate students or kids or something like that. But that's a famous example in some circles. Madoff, um, Ken Lay, the head of Enron, Wiener, um, the Ashley Madison site. You can come up with plenty of other examples. I mean, today, uh, everything from the college admissions cheating scandal that happened um, to sadly the West Point um, cheating scandal that's very, very recent in the news to, I'm sorry, whoops, uh, other examples make honesty always, I think, 
a very timely and relevant topic to talk about. So I never have any uh, trouble getting people wanting to talk about this. The problem though is that, now as I move along, um, it's the philosophers and the psychologists and the researchers who have done very, very little work on honesty. There's almost nothing written in the contemporary academic research on the virtue of honesty. To give you a sense, um, Aristotle, the, the hero of talk of, of character and virtue in the West, doesn't have honesty on his list. It doesn't appear. He has something uh, somewhat related, but not honesty. In contemporary philosophy, there hasn't been a book written in the last 50 years, uh, no edited volumes, and just two or three articles in the last 50 years in the entire discipline of philosophy on honesty. So this led us to think by us, I mean myself and some of other people at Wake Forest University that we need to try and change things. We need to get people paying more attention to honesty at a scholarly level and academic level and hope that that will also trickle down uh, to you know, a more popular level too. So in August of this year, we launched what's called the Honesty Project. You can see it there, uh, the website's there too, trying to incentivize researchers to shift their research in the direction of honesty both philosophers and people who are doing empirical research, we are funding $1.8 million in new scholarship on honesty, as well as doing a whole bunch of stuff at our uh, conferences, summer seminars, uh, writing projects of our own here at Wake Forest. So if that's of interest, please come check out. My own research for the last few years has not surprisingly been on honesty as well. And so what I wanna share with you is some of my early thoughts. Uh, subject to revision and you can tell me where I, you think I go wrong. So I've got about a series of maybe six or seven topics I wanna to cover and see what you think about these ideas. So to start us off with some background, I'll make some, some distinctions like a philosopher always does. So I'm gonna focus not primarily on actions which we can describe as honest, like Smith did the honest thing and telling the truth on the stand in the courtroom. And I'm not primarily gonna focus on momentary thoughts which we can describe as honest, so Jones carried out a thorough and honest assessment of the evidence in the case. I wanna focus on statements like these. Roberts is an honest person. I spent enough time with him to know that he is really dishonest and you don't wanna be his friend. Uh, and her honesty really stands out in her application. We should definitely hire her. In other words, I wanna focus on the virtue of honesty understood as a character trait. Uh, disposition of our psychology of our minds, our character that gives rise to, that leads to thoughts and subsequently to actions, but is ultimately traced back to who we are fundamentally as a person, our character. Okay, so that's my starting point, the virtue of honesty understood as a character trait. Okay, well, that doesn't take us very far. So let's get to another question. What does honesty cover? What ground does it cover? What does it pertain to? What issues um, does it apply to? Well, here are some possibilities. You could say, well, one thing it does is honesty stops lying. Someone who reliably tells unjustifiable lies is not someone we would tend to call honest. That seems pretty safe. I, mean, I don't think that's too controversial. You also think it covers misleading. That's different from lying. So someone who misleads, uh, withholds important information, tells half-truths, something like that. So I'll give you an example. Uh, suppose a spouse comes back from the bar uh, and then the next day, he was at the bar last night and the next day um, his wife says, where were you? And, he, and the guy says, well, I was at the bar last night. Well, that's true, but that's not the whole story. He neglected it to say where he was after the bar last night on purpose. He, hold it, he told, told a half-truth and in withholding important information. That seems like it's dishonest. It's a failure of honesty, something that honesty should pertain to as well. But he could even go broader in scope than that. You could say it applies to stealing. Someone who reliably steals maybe is not someone we would call honest. Might also apply to cheating. Someone who regularly cheats at games or other uh, uh, activities where cheating could come into play is not someone we would call honest. And maybe even promise breaking as well. Uh, someone who regularly breaks reasonable promises we might not call honest. 
this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, there are others you, you put down here. You could put down things like um, hip hypocrisy, being a hypocrite, self-deception, bullshitting, um, lots of fraud. But these are five central aspects that seem to fall under the purview of honesty and dishonesty. Now, already this might be controversial. You might say, hold on, Miller, uh, you've already gone astray. So it's true that um, one way to think about this is that honesty pertains to all five of these. You might say, no, but another way to think about this is that honesty pertains just to matters of lying and misleading. And that the other three, cheating, stealing, and promise breaking have um, something to do with another virtue, another vice. My own way of thinking about it is I go broad here. I think honesty casts cast a broad net. It covers a lot of moral territory. It's one of the reasons why it's such an important virtue. And so I'm going to be operating under the assumption that all five of these have to do with honesty and dishonesty. Uh, nothing will really hang on that if you disagree with me and you think it's narrower. I think a lot of what I have to say will still be relevant. So if you think it's those five areas that are the bad sides, here are the five areas which are the good sides, the corresponding good sides. Truthfulness, the virtue of being disposed to reliably tell the truth when appropriate. Forthrightness, reliably avoid giving misleading answers. So that's the opposite of that, um, that misleading uh, vice I was talking about. Being respectful of property, that's the opposite of the stealing. Proper obedience, that's the opposite of the cheating. And fidelity to promises, well, that's self-explanatory from the name. So you might think, look, there are five areas where there we could go wrong or we could do, go well, we could excel, we could display excellence. And yet they all have to do with honesty, I say. They're all different facets or aspects of honesty. And that leads us to a really fundamental question of, well, what is it that unites them, that unifies them, that connects them? What is at the core of honesty so that honesty has its kind of, you know, uh, fingertips or its tentacles or whatever you want to analogy you want to use, stretching out so far into so many different areas of morality. Why do all these arrows point to honesty? This is what's called the unification challenge. I'm the only one, as far as I know, who's tried to tackle this and, and answer it. Um, and I think it's a really challenging question. That's why I call it the, the unification challenge. And I'll give you an answer. So we come to the third topic for today. The nature question. By nature, I mean, what is the nature of honesty? What is honesty at its core? In its heart? What is, it, what is the heart of being an honest person? And here's my proposal. Now, this could be, you know, uh, uh, very implausible. It could be, uh, there are other good proposals out there. I'd love to hear them, uh, but this is what I have to offer for now. I say the virtue of honesty is centrally and reliably a character trait concerned with not intentionally distorting the facts as the person sees them. Okay, I'll let that, I'll say that slower. Second time, there's a lot there. The virtue of honesty is centrally and reliably a character trait concerned with not intentionally distorting the facts as the person sees them. For people who are coming late, um, there's a handout. It's completely optional. Uh, the link to it is in the chat. Um, so what does this mean? There's a lot that needs to be unpacked here. Reliably. Well, if you're an honest person, you can't just be honest in one situation. You don't get to count as honest just by being honest in the courtroom, but nowhere else. Or in a classroom, but nowhere else. Your honesty has to exhibit cross-situational consistency. You have to be consistently honest across a variety of situations where honesty can come into play. The office, the courtroom, the party, at home, at work, and, this, and so forth. And reliably over time. You can't just be a one-off today, but never again. You wanna see a consistent pattern of honesty over time. Distorting. I mean by that, not, I'm oh, sorry. I mean, misrepresenting. Another way to think about it is misrepresenting. So the honest person does not misrepresent the facts, avoids doing that. And I'll give some examples and I'll clarify some more, but that's another way to think about this, misrepresenting, distorting. Intentionally, I mean, this. they don't do this on purpose. Sometimes accidents can happen. 
you're in a shop. I don't know if this ever happened. And, uh, you know, accidentally you walk out with something that you didn't purpose, you didn't purchase. Uh, so, you know, pocketbook, uh, an orange falls into a pocketbook. Later you open up the pocketbook and discover the orange inside. You're not being dishonest. That wasn't on purpose. It was just an accident that it fell in, into the pocketbook. What I'm talking about here though, is not intentionally doing it on purpose, storing the facts. And then finally, the facts. So now I need you to, to think about your own intuitions here. This is gonna be given an example and see how you intuitively react to it. I can't do, I do it, what I do if this was in person where I'd ask you all to raise your hands and see if you agree or not, but at least ask yourself this. Here's an example to help us understand the facts. So the Flat Earth Society, there is such a thing. There are members, they have a somewhat of a voice um, and they believe that the earth is flat. Uh, hard, to, hard to understand, but that's what they believe. So hypothetically, suppose Samantha sincerely believes that the earth is flat. One day she's asked by a friend about the shape of the earth and to keep her own beliefs a secret. Samantha tries to mislead her friend and replies that the earth is round. She succeeds and her friend now assumes that Samantha believes the earth is round. Was Samantha being honest? <clears throat> I say no. I'd be interested in your intuition. You can tell me later, do you agree with that or not? Um, even though she's telling what is objectively true, which is that the earth is round, even though she's saying something that's objectively true, the earth is round, she's not being honest. In contrast, suppose instead of Samantha is forthright, she tells her friend that she believes that the earth is flat and has no intention to mislead her friend at all. Well, what's your intuition there? Well, my intuition there is that she's being honest, even though her belief in what she's saying is radically mistaken. She's still being honest, or at least she's not being dishonest. So that shows to me that Honesty tracks more what you think rather than what's reality, what is in reality, what is reality is actually like. If you're representing what you think accurately, you're being honest. If you misrepresent what you think, then you're being dishonest. Even if what you think happens to be the correct truth. If you misrepresent it to others, you're being dishonest. So you get all kinds of interesting possibilities. You have true belief in a true assertion that leads to honest action. That's no, no surprise. False belief in a false assertion can lead to honest action. That might be a little surprising. You can believe something falsely and make a false claim and still be honest. That's what Samantha does in the second example. She believes that the earth is round. I mean, sorry, she believes that the earth is flat. And she reports that the earth is flat. She's being honest about her belief and assertion. You can have a false belief and make a true assertion. You can tell the truth and still be dishonest. And you can have a true belief and a false assertion and be dishonest. What's the upshot of this? So let's go back for a second. That's why I say it's not intentionally distort the facts as the person sees them. Right? So you can be a... Um, conspiracy theorist, and be honest on this definition, you can be a um, doomsday apocalyptic person and be honest. Um, you can be a flat earther and be honest. You might have shortcomings in other areas of your life, you know, flaws in other areas. You gotta fix some other problems maybe, um, but honesty is compatible with even those positions. Okay. To illustrate this a little bit more, give us some more examples, um, a line, how does this go? An honest person reliably does not intentionally distort the facts as she believes them to be by telling lies about those facts to others, especially if those lies are more than just everyday or white lies. So suppose Smith tells his friend, here, I'm sorry, his teacher, not his friend, uh, tells the teacher that the dog ate his homework. The dog didn't eat his homework. He's trying to pat, pull a fast one on his teacher. Uh, what is he doing? He's intentionally distorting the facts, right? <laughs> He's trying to get his teacher to believe something that doesn't correspond to how he believes what actually happened. Um, and that's the case of lying and that's gonna be a failure of honesty for me. Similarly, stealing, an honest person would not, would not intentionally distort the facts as she believes them to be by stealing property. 
that she believes belongs to another and thereby trying to make it the case that it belongs to her. Trying to make it her property or his property uh, and when it's not. Here's another example. Again, I would ask you for this is in person for a show of hands to tell you, to tell me whether you have the same intuition that I do about this example, but maybe you can just tell me afterwards now. Um, here's the, think about this one. Timothy is missing his brand new notebook at school and spies one that looks just like it on top of another student's desk. When no one is looking, he takes a notebook, writes his name on top of it, and starts using it to do his homework. Unbeknownst to him, this is actually his original notebook that he'd absentmindedly left in the wrong place yesterday. I think Timothy is failing to be honest there. Even though he didn't steal something that belonged to someone else, even though it's his notebook, he didn't realize that He's intentionally distorting the facts as he believes them to be, he counts as failing to be honest. All right, um, maybe I've gone on enough about that. Let's get to a fourth question. So we talked about behavior, but there is another side to character and that's motivation. And I wanna say for honesty, behavior matters, but so does motivation. Um, I give some arguments for that. In the interest of time, I think I'll, I'll pass over. If you, um, if you doubt motiv the motivational requirements, just ask me afterwards and I can say why I think motivation is important. Here we go. The virtue of honesty is centrally reliably a character trait concern for good or virtuous motivating reasons. In other words, your heart has to be in the right place. If you're telling the truth, not cheating, not stealing, and so forth, but for crappy reasons, to use a technical term in philosophy, um, no, that's, that's not a technical term in philosophy, um, to, for bad reasons, that doesn't get to you to honesty. You don't get to count. You gotta have your heart in the right place as well as your outward expression of behavior. But of course, that invites the question, well, what are good or virtuous motivating reasons for honest behavior? And I'll give you my own take on that. Sorry, self-interest is out the door. So if you're telling the truth simply to make a good impression on someone else, or if you're not cheating on the test just so you can avoid punishment, or if you're doing whatever honest action to try and get a promotion or avoid a demotion or whatever it might be, that's all self-interested. That's about you. You're doing it to benefit yourself in some way or prevent yourself from being harmed in some way. That's off the table. Uh, as far as being a virtuous reason for action. Of course, it's, I'm not saying it's ever wrong. It's, it's fine, of course, to be self-interested. Uh, but if you want to uh, attain the level of being a virtuous person in general, and in particular, the level of uh, being a virtuous person when it comes to honesty, self-interested motivating reasons are gonna count. Otherwise, I think we can go in a variety of different directions. I'm not gonna be really militant about this. Um, I am a pluralist about motivation. What do I mean by that? Let's approach it more tangibly, less, less theoretically. Why did you tell the truth about your past business failures? When it would have been so much easier to lie? Well, if someone says he deserved to hear the truth, that's fine with, to me. If someone says, I don't lie to my friends, that's fine with me, to me too. If someone says it's important for us to be able to trust each other, that's fine too. If someone said it would not have been honest, that seems to me fine too. These are four very different reasons, four different answers you could give, but I would be reticent to say that only one of them counts. I think we can let a lot of different options uh, stay on the table for honest motivation. Another example, why didn't you cheat the test when you could have gotten away with it? If the answer is, why well, I didn't want to get, I didn't run the risk of failing out of Wake Forest, that's not going to count. That's self interested. But if the answer is, that would not have been fair, I don't want, didn't want to respect Professor Miller. Of course, then you get an A in the class, but um, no, I'm just joking with that. Um, that's a great answer. What if everyone were to cheat? That would be a terrible world to live in. It would not have been honest. Again, four different answers 
that seemed fine to me. I wouldn't want to exclude anybody. Why didn't you break, didn't you break the painful promise? I loved him. That seems fine to me. <clears throat> a loving motive for honesty. Now consider this alternative. I owed it to him. Why didn't you break the promise? I owed it to him. That seems fine too. Um, a justice motive for honesty. So what do we get? We get pl pluralism here. Loving ultimate motives. They're fine. Justice ultimate motives. Friendship ultimate motives. Beautiful ultimate motives. Honesty ultimate motives. Because it would have been dishonest or it would have been honest. All these seem to me to be perfectly legitimate examples of what can count as honest motivation in an honest person. And I can't see a way to reduce them all down to one fundamental motive for honest behavior. So I let it all just stay like that. I let a thousand or however many different kinds there are uh, flowers bloom and uh, go from there. That's the official view. And I think we've done enough philosophy. Let's get into something else. Um, Vice, I will skip over in the interest of time. If anyone wants me to ask me about the vice of deficiency and the vice of excess for honesty, feel free. We can talk about that later if you like. Um, but I do think I need to um, try and hit the highlights at least and cut some things to make sure we have time for Q&A. So let's go to the possession question. Now philosophy, let's get our hands dirty in empirical data from psychology. Because the possession question is a question about whether people actually have this virtue or not. It's not the question, what is honesty? That's a more philosophical question. It's the question, do pe are people honest? Does it exist in our society? To what extent is, it, uh, is the virtue of honesty possessed? And that kind of question I can't answer from the armchair. I can't just sit in my office here at Wake Forest and think really hard, okay, I've got the answer. It's 50% or it's 75%. That's not gonna work. I need some empirical data to help me sort through that. So <clears throat> here's some possible answers we might arrive at. We can say most people have the virtue of honesty. Uh, I wouldn't really be optimistic about that one, but maybe uh, most people have the vice of dishonesty. Most people occupy a middle space between honesty and dishonesty. Maybe they're a mixed bag or they uh, have a mixed character. People are split roughly equally between some having virtue of honesty and others having vice of dishonesty. People are split roughly equally between honesty, dishonesty, and the middle space. And other options too. We just don't know ahead of time. These are conceptual possibilities, but we have to get some data to help us sort through them. Well, unfortunately, the data is not great. Um, we have some serious limitations uh, to the data such as it exists now. Another reason why we're doing the honesty project and trying to get more work, more attention being paid to this topic. Here's one big limitation. Almost all the studies involve Western populations. Another one is that there are almost no longitudinal studies. So that means following the same people over time, as opposed to a study which just looks at a group of people at a one single moment. Let's take the same people and follow them over time in different situations. They're very hard to do, very expensive. Not enough good data to assess honesty in general for stealing, for promise breaking, for deceiving. However, when we come to lying and cheating, there I think we do have a fair amount of good data and I've kind of summarized it and reviewed it in a, um, in, a, in, a chapter in a book that's coming out this year. So let me give you just a little bit of a taste of that data. Can't go into it too much. Um, so please uh, you know, understand that this is very, very selective. And just a cursory review, and then you'll see where uh, I end up with in my conclusion about what people's character looks like. So here's an old study from 1976. Participants are taking a test. Experimenter says he has to leave for 10 minutes. Experimenter sets a timer bell for five minutes with a warning to remember to not to go any further after the bell rings. So trusting those people to listen to the bell and stop when it rings. What do you think they did? Well, again, if we were in person, I'd ask for a show of hands. How many people think that they went over five minutes? How many people think they went under five minutes? But here's the answer. 71% went over five minutes. 
hey, that doesn't improve anything. That's not a, a big dramatic study, but it's, uh, it's one piece of the puzzle. Here's a more recent one. Uh, this is Brian and colleagues, 2013, told online participants about recent evidence for the paranormal. Uh, you know, this is this involves a little bit of deception. Um, it's funny that a lot of honesty studies involve being dishonest to participants, but we'll let that go. Um, ask them to flip a coin ten times while trying to influence the outcome of each flip of their minds. They were told they would receive one dollar for each time they reported getting heads. How do you think they did? Their minds were really powerful. Well, they were told, I mean, you can, don't, don't cheat. Please don't cheat report. You know, even a small amount of cheating would undermine the study. So please, 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 please don't cheat. And nevertheless, <clears throat> participants reported 6.22 heads well above chance. Not as much as they could have. They could have said 10 and got paid accordingly. Seemed like they cheated to some extent, not as much as they could. Another study, I'll skip this one, just this is a die roll instead of a coin flip. So you get paid based upon the die roll and similarly cheating was found in that study, but not as much as it could have been. And let me end with this one, one of my favorite ones to talk about by Lisa Shu in 2011. <clears throat> Each participant completed a worksheet with 20 problems. They knew they would be pa paid 50 cents per correct answer. This is one that, you know, connects closely to me as a teacher, thinking about my students and student cheating and how to incentivize them to not cheat for, for the right reasons. So in this case, they would be paid per correct answer in the control condition. They had no opportunity to cheat. They would just take the test, turn it in, someone in charge would grade it. They would be paid based upon their performance. We're done. A different group though, in a shredder condition, well, in this case, there was some wiggle room. They would be the ones to grade their answer keys. The materials would be shredded and they would be paid according to what they reported their performance to be. No questions asked. Well, how do you think they did? In quotation marks, how do you think they did? I've already primed you for this, you know, probably set you up for the answer. So um, there's not, probably not the shredder they used, but a picture of a shredder. And in a no opportunity to cheat, the baseline, 7.97. And the opportunity to cheat, 13.22. That's not just, I don't think, based upon the second group being much smarter and much better at the tests. I think we know what was going on there, what the real reason was why they uh, reported that average. Okay, so um, generalizing. Lots of more studies I could report to you. We don't have time to get into them. Um, I'm just gonna summarize some of the findings. The majority of participants across a lot of these studies engaged in cheating behavior when they thought they could get away with it and there was some non-trivial reward associated with cheating. And at the same time, when participants cheated in the behavioral tasks, it was usually to a moderate degree and almost never the full amount they were able to. That's the second observation. I think it's well established in the literature. <clears throat> now, why, what's going on? How do we explain this data? What's the causal story about the psychology of most people? Here's, again, covering uh, ground pretty quickly, and I think this is a fair representation of the leading explanation of what's going on. Most people generally believe that cheating is morally wrong, at least in most cases. That's a good thing. That, that belief is there. At the same time, most people want to cheat if by doing so they can benefit themselves in some way by their own lights. <clears throat> it makes the cheating seem worthwhile and if they think they can get away with it and not get caught. So we've got two things going on now and some tension. A belief that cheating is wrong and also a desire to cheat if you think you can get away with it and be worthwhile. There's more to this story though. Two other elements are often used to explain cheating behavior. Most people want others to think of themselves as honest people. So impression management matters. We want others to have a positive view of ourselves in general and of our character and want others to think of us as good people and in particular here as honest people. And then finally, most people want to think of themselves as honest people. That's different than the third. 
Most people want to think of themselves. So I want to be able to think of myself independently of what other people think. I want to be able to think of myself as an honest person. And it's <clears throat> now those are four elements of this explanation. Uh, they are all important. They all fit the data. They help explain why people cheat to some extent, but they don't cheat as much as they could. Because if you went all the way and cheated, say, I got 20 problems correct, or I got heads every single time, then it'll be very hard to think of yourself as an honest person. But if you bend the rules to some degree, to moderate degree, if you say, yeah, I inflated the, inflate the results a little bit, then you can maybe can hold it all together. Both uh, your belief that you're an honest person and your desire to cheat and benefit from cheating. So to wrap this up, this section up, um, here's a question. How does this explanatory psychological story fits with a conceptual account of what it is to be an honest person? Or to put it in a lot easier language than that, is this the mindset you'd expect of an honest person? Is that what you would expect an honest person to be like, to think that way, to feel that way? And I say, no. I say that the data such that it is supports a picture like this, where most of us, by that us means in the West, because the studies are in the West, and people today, because we don't have studies going back hundreds of years ago, most of us fall short of honesty. We don't qualify as being honest people. We're somewhere in the middle, which you can see on this uh, diagram here in front of you, a murky middle space between honesty and dishonesty. That's where I put uh, most people, but not all people. I think it's a bell curve here. I think they're outliers. You could have your uh, exceptionally honest people on the left-hand side, the I'm looking at at least, and your dishonest people on the right-hand side. There are certainly people like that too. You've got your Abraham Lincolns on the one hand, and you got your, you know, put it wherever you want um, for my first slide, the people in the news um, on, your, on the right-hand side for dishonesty. And most of us, I think, are mixed bag, falling short of honesty. Okay, so what? Who cares? Why does this matter? Well, this might have some disturbing implications. Here's one, this might be unsettling. Many of your friends who you think are honest probably are not. Now, I, that, uh, that probably is too strong. I, I, I may have just embellished that a little bit for rhetorical effect. Um, I mean, you, you know, you're thinking you're close friends, you, can, you know them well, um, and I think you can look into their, their character and uh, like, you know, hope, hopefully they're honest. Uh, but many of at least your acquaintances and casual friends and so forth probably are not honest. Stat on statistical grounds, I'm, I mean, <clears throat> we should be very cautious before judging someone to be honest or dishonest. We need to know his or her character very well. A couple of behavioral observations are not enough. <clears throat> uh, I, I'm uh, an advocate of exhibiting a lot of caution here before labeling somebody, someone with a character label. <clears throat> we can, excuse me. We can predict how people behave better with a more complex understanding of the characters rather than by just calling them honest in general or dishonest in general. We can label someone as honest, they're going to behave in some cases in a surprising way that don't meet your expectations. Same if you label someone as dishonest. We should lower our expectations about how honest people will tend to be, unless you're already pretty cynical about that, um, in which case you maybe don't need to lower them. And maybe for some people, maybe you should raise your expectations if they are not in fact dishonest. And in the last one, by understanding how we fall short of honesty, we can work harder, and more productively at the growing in honesty and becoming more honest people. All right. And with that, um, that takes us to the final topic. If I'm okay on time, we started a little, little bit late. Um, okay. Final topic for today. So here's how it's gone. Yeah. First, trying to figure out what honesty is. It's more philosophical, but unpack the definition and get clear on the concepts. We need to know what the standard is. The, what we're talking about, what, what this conversation is about. Secondly, how are we actually doing today? What are the facts on the ground? Are most people honest? Second part. Thirdly, in light of this 
what I call a character gap between our actual character and our honest character. Thirdly, now we, there's the cultivation question. <laughs> there's the question of given that this is the definition of honesty, what we should be aiming for, and given that we fall short of it, what steps can we take to try and bridge that gap, to shrink that space between our actual character and the honest character we should have? This is a huge topic. Um, there's no way I can do it any kind of justice here, but at least I'll give you, by way of conclusion, a few preliminary ideas and maybe some more practical suggestions as a takeaway. Okay, I think one way to go here is to go back to that psychological picture and try to target different areas of it. So start by that first piece being most people genuinely believe that cheating is morally wrong. If that's true, how can we use that to our advantage to try and foster honesty, to promote honesty in our own lives, personally, in the lives of our friends and family members, in my case, in the lives of my children and my students? <laughs> well, the thought arises here that let's try and increase the salience of these moral beliefs. Let's make them more conscious, more psychologically relevant, more of a part of our daily lives as opposed to being suppressed or hidden or not playing as big of a role. And I'll uh, propose two specific applications of that in the form of more reminders and role models. So sustain more reminders and then role models of honesty. Let me elaborate on each of them briefly. So sustain more reminders. There's the idea use regular moral reminders that serve to make our moral commitment salient and thereby work against our solely pursuing our own self-interest. That way of putting it shows it doesn't just apply to honesty. This can be across the board, anything having to do with, mor with morality. But since we're talking about honesty, I'll give an example, namely the honor code. I know you all uh, in the military in general uh, values the honor code very seriously. Um, some schools and places of, uh, you know, middle schools, high schools, colleges do not. I'm working to try and get them to change their outlook and realize the honor code is really valuable, really important. To get into this a little bit empirically, let's go back to that study that had to do with the shredder and taking the test with the 20 problems. Here's some other researchers, Mazur and colleagues from 2008. They were using that shredder set up as well, 50 cents per correct answer. Control condition, only 3.4 out of 20 correct. The shredder condition, 6.1 out of 20 correct in quotation marks. But now in a third variation, they had the participants who were students sign their university's honor code before taking the test. And here were the results, 3.1. So not statistically significant difference from 3.4. The point is it goes back down to the baseline. Even if we increase the incentive to cheat, $2 per correct answer. Control, control condition 3.2, shredder condition 5.0, and honor code condition 3.0. So increased monetary incentive to cheat had no impact in that version either. What's the idea? I'm sorry, I'm kind of ahead of myself. What's the idea here? The idea is that the honor code serves as a moral reminder. It brought to mind people's values, which they had all along, they just were not paying attention to them. They were not cog cognizant of them. They the honor code triggered those values and had those values play a causal role in steering people in the right direction and away from cheating. That's the idea. Lots of other studies bear this out in a more systematic fashion. If you're interested in this, um, McCabe, Donald McCabe is, I think, probably the best person on this. 28% uh, of college students without an honor code, reporting helping another person on a test versus 9% with an honor code. Plagiarism, 18 versus 7. Crib notes, 21 versus 9. Collaboration of the unpermitted kind, 39 versus 21. There's no promise that the honor code is going to cure everything. Look, in each of these, there's still cheating going on. 
It's instead meant to be a way to try and curb incentives to cheat. Not going to fix any problems. Never, no, not going to be any more cheating scandals. No, 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 no. That's not what the claim is. It's meant to be a helpful tool. And there are others. Uh, plenty of others. More reminders. Uh, there, uh, these are on the handouts. If you want to go back and look at them, I won't take the time um, to go through them in detail. But a daily reading, confession, the friend or family member or higher power, if you happen to believe in higher power. Um, Tangible moral reminders. People used to wear the WWJD wristbands or live strong. Um, those serve as moral reminders. Technology can be harnessed to good sometimes. Um, text messages, emails with encouragements to be um, more honest. And a reflective after the day is done, as opposed to a reading at the beginning of the day, reflective after the day is done, diary or summary of how the day has gone, including uh, moments where there was an opportunity to cheat or not. So that's the idea of uh, more reminders. Real uh, quickly, the other strategy here designed to increase the salience of our moral values and our values against, uh, against cheating and lying and stealing is a, to appeal to more role models. <clears throat> Here's a great example, a more historical one, of course, Abraham Lincoln is you ask who, historically in America, who's the exemplar of honesty? Most people would say Abraham Lincoln. This strategy isn't limited to honesty though. You can talk about the strategy with respect to courage, Harriet Tubman. Um, you can talk about it with respect to compassion, Leopold Sosha, who protected 20 Jews in a sewer system in Poland for two years during World War II. Um, it's an extraordinary story. The broad idea is that look, uh, there are people who do much better than us when it comes to their character. They are exemplary. They are moral heroes. They are moral saints. They are, uh, they are they're morally virtuous. And we can seek them out, come to admire them. And when we admire them, not just at a distance, our admiration can trigger in us a desire to emulate them, to imitate them, to become more like them. Not in every way. I don't, you know, no desire to become presidents. Um, but in the respect that matters, the basis for the admiration, the honesty, the courage, the compassion. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a cognitive process. I admire them. It's also an emotional process. I'm inspired and moved powerfully to become more like them in my own life, to elevate my character to their level rather than dragging their character down to my level. Um, since I'm a professor, uh, you know, I think about what, what, how this might go in, in the student context and how this might be practically implemented. So um, this might have some, you know, this might be able to be adapted, uh, but the thought is have students research and ideally interview a relevant and attainable exemplar of honesty uh, with an emphasis on the student's emotional responses to learning about the exemplar's honesty. A uh, couple of things that really seem to matter on empirical grounds here, that's relevance. If the person is just is so living in such different times and in different circumstances that you don't really speak to your own, you know, your, your own world, then they're not gonna have much of an impact. Attainable, if they're so holy and so perfect, that sometimes can be discouraging because they don't seem like I could ever become like them, kind of hopeless and could, could, could feel like you're beat down by them. So it helps uh, to have an attainable exemplar. And if there's this emotional connection, someone you can you know, relate to and bond with at an emotional level. Okay, very last thing for today, I promise. Um, I think we're, we're good on time. So it's just one more idea. This is gonna be uh, the, the sketchiest and the quickest to go by. Um, we can certainly unpack it more, uh, but at least I thought I should say something about number two here, not just number one. So number two, remember, was the kind of less admirable side of our character, according to which most people want to cheat if by doing so they can benefit themselves in some way that makes the cheating seem worthwhile if they think they can get away with it and not get caught. Yeah, it's great to highlight the positive side, emphasize the moral values and the moral beliefs, but it seems like something should be said about this too, the, the more negative side from an honesty perspective. Well, I guess the goal here would be to try and weaken the desire. 
well, at least a goal, maybe not the only goal. One thing you try to do here is weaken people's desire, including my own desire, to cheat. How much you go about that? Well, punishment, of course, is a strategy. Um, I'm not opposed to it in any way. Um, you can have a weaker desire to cheat if you fear that you're going to get punished if you're discovered for cheating. That could certainly weaken your desire to cheat. Um, or if you think that you know, there are very, very few opportunities to actually get caught. And so you might not pay much attention to cheating if you think you're not going to uh, ever have an opportunity to get away with it. One caveat, though, when it comes to punishment is that even if you find people cheating less, that only covers the behavioral side. And I've said that motivation and the heart matter too. So if it's less cheating behavior, but because of punishment avoidance reasons, I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to get kicked out of such and such school. I don't want to, don't want to get demoted. That's not a virtuous reason. So that not, will not take you all the way to honesty, I say. It's, it's, it's good. I mean, I don't want to, hey, less cheating, that's great. If the behavior is improved, thumbs up, right? We, we need some of that right now. Um, fewer cheating, but it's not going to be taking you all the way where, where I think we need to go. Another way to go here, and this is going to be just very hand wavy and, and sketchy, uh, but another way to go is to instead of foster, uh, making it just punishment, is to use other virtues to come alongside of honesty and try and grow honesty. Virtues like love and compassion. So if you have genuine love, I don't mean erotic love here. I mean, that is genuine love too, but I'm, I'm talking about a different kind of love, more agapeistic love. Love for the other person for his or her own sake. Caring about what's good for the other person for his or her own sake. But that's what we're talking about. That seems to me to be fundamentally incompatible with the desire to cheat someone. You really love someone, it's hard to see how you can do that and at the same time cheat them for self-interested gain. So to the extent to which I want to cheat or lie to my children, my parents, my wife, without good reason, seems like that's going to undermine to some extent my love for them. And so the suggestion is to foster other virtues as well. It's not just honesty in a vacuum, but foster a variety of virtues together and they can mutually reinforce and grow each other. And so the extent to which we grow love and compassion, we can also grow in honesty as well. Okay, and with that, I'll leave you some, uh, some caveats here and some, some questions. Uh, this is just scratching the surface. There's so much more to be done. Um, questions I didn't even get a chance to get into today, like is lying ever permitted? What about light, light lies? What about serious situations where you could protect innocent people by lying? Um, why do I say that there's lack of evidence for dishonesty? I said it was mainly lack of, I, I said it's mainly evidence for lack of honesty, but what about dishonesty? And are there other strategies worth exploring for fostering honesty? I'd love to hear them. Um, I don't say by any means that I've covered all of them. There are plenty of others that are worth covering too. I'll stop here. Um, thank you for putting up with me over your lunch. And um, note that I'm trying to get all, into all this in a lot more detail in the book that's coming out this year and say thank you and thank funding sources.